Good morning. My name is Ed Benedict and I am the worship associate for today's service. Welcome to the Sunday service for the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tampa. It's a great day to announce that we're open again for services, for Sunday services, and particularly because today is the first day of spring. Uh, if you were a first time attender at our church, I hope that as a visitor, you'll hear something that might bring you back. If you're a second, third, or fourth time visitor, thank you for coming today. We hope that you will consider joining us as soon as a member. If you're a member of our church, I'd like to say thank you very much for not only your uh, continued support of our services, but for your financial contributions that allowed us to keep open during the pandemic and has, has helped us to be able to <clears throat> pay our employees and keep on the air and the lights and maintain our facilities throughout these troubling times. Our guest speaker today is our minister, the Reverend Jim, Dr. McComber. Uh, Reverend Jim today is going to talk to us on a, uh, a topic that uh, gets our attentions right away. It's dealing with, and now I can't find it. Is. It's dealing with the, uh, the two P's and a D, uh, power, privilege, and diversity. And now, Reverend Jim uh, McComer. Hello, I'm Reverend Jim McComber. I'm the minister of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tampa. And ordinarily this sermon that you're about to listen to would have been recorded during its live presentation uh, on Sunday, March 20th. We had the little trouble with the, uh, the internet uh, gremlins getting in the way and the recording was, was, uh, was not accomplished. And so we're trying it again here at this time. So here we go. We Unitarian Universalists have experienced our share of institutional turmoil in recent years. A huge controversy erupted when a female Hispanic finalist for a regional executive position here in Florida was passed over and yet another white male got the appointment. Evidently they told her he was a better fit. In spite of our avowed commitment to anti-racism and multiculturalism, our 95 plus percent white denomination is run pretty much by white people, at least in the jobs that carry salaries. We find minorities and people of color in some positions, but not so much, not so much among those who lead and administer our religious movement. At the time of this controversy, the president of our association of congregations was the Reverend Peter Morales, the first Hispanic elected to that office. As events unfolded, he became defensive and realized that people of color are way underrepresented in staff positions because that he felt obliged to resign only three months before completing his presidential term. Indeed, several other executive staff members felt obliged to resign as well. And, and the white minister, Florida appointment, changed his mind and turned it down. At about the same time, UUs of color, having wearied of ineffectual efforts in our commitment to anti-racism and multiculturalism, began to promote what came to be called the Eighth Principle Project. Perhaps it was due to stubbornness, as with Shel Silverstein's Spunky Monkey and Funky Donkey. 
everyone waiting for someone else to step up and get something done. A couple of months ago, someone, I've forgotten who exactly, suggested I preach about this eighth principle. So here we go. I believe that we UUs have much to learn about how power and privilege operate, how they promote the status quo and hence stand in the way of diversity. It seems to be a corollary to Newton's first law, the law of inertia or stubbornness. A body at rest tends to stay at rest and a body in motion along some trajectory tends to keep moving along that path unless some external force is applied to make it move or to change its trajectory. The law seems to apply equally to communities. Communities too have inertia thanks to power, privilege, and other factors. Such inertia inhibits diversity, seemingly true even when we embrace diversity as a desirable attribute. Let's go back to the 2008 US presidential campaign. You may recall then candidate Barack Obama's noteworthy speech about race and racism. It was in response to the outcry about his own pastor's impassioned sermons about the failure of racial justice in America. The Reverend Jeremiah Wright's words were broadcast over and over and over again as he implored God to damn America for coming up short. It wasn't merely racism that lay at the root of the media-inspired controversy over his words. Commentators attacked Obama in shrill voices. Why haven't you repudiated Reverend Wright for his unpatriotic rhetoric? Why haven't you quit that terrible church? Obama's responses were thoughtful measured and gentle. He deftly challenged America to a conversation about race and racism. Many said that his speech represented the most important reflection on racism since Dr. King was on the scene. Our own denominational president at the time, the Reverend Bill Sinkford, calling Obama's speech, A Gift to America, wrote this, in a quote, much of the conversation about race is so filled with political correctness that truth is hard to come by. Whites move so easily to denial, citing the progress that has been made in recent decades and, and glossing over the glaring disparities in opportunity, income, and even incarceration that remain. African Americans and people of color generally, including myself, show up defensive, afraid that the reality of our lives will yet again be deemed unimportant, that we will yet again be made invisible. End quote. The media rushed to judgment against Jeremiah Wright and blamed Obama for his pastor's rhetoric. More than racism, it's really about power and privilege. Wright, Obama, and Sinkford all focused on race and racism at that time as the issue. To me, it's really only one of many issues, most of them ending with ism. The isms include racism, 
sexism, ageism, heterosexism, ableism, classism, and more. Sociologist Alan Johnson in his book, Privilege, Power, and Difference, argues that the isms that plague us do not exist in isolation from each other. Collectively, they form a complex matrix of cultural privilege and thereby convey power to a relative few. We who enjoy privilege and the power that comes with it are most often oblivious to it. Power and privilege themselves become invisible in that they become the natural way to do things. Men open doors for women. Traditional courtesy or a subtle sexist reminder that women are dependent on men. I appear to be a reasonably able-bodied, straight, white, middle-class male. And these attributes convey privilege to me. The passing of time has cost me in terms of ageism, but that's only one determinant of privilege among many. My privileges are not personal. It's not something I've earned. Privilege is ordinarily unearned. It comes with group membership, with identity. And the media invariably try to oversimplify the issue as well as ignoring that privilege and hence empowerment is also part of every commentator's self-identity. The media broadside against Wright was fired at a black preacher, mostly by privileged white male commentators under the cover of a privileged version of patriotism. And the premise that black ministers ought to preach like privileged white ministers. You know what? That kind of preaching in support of the status quo was never what the biblical prophets, as Isaiah, or Jeremiah, or Jesus ever did. And that's not what Jeremiah writes was doing either. He preached liberation theology. It's about the poor and the oppressed who have enjoyed no measurable benefit from the civil rights movement. They're still poor. They're still oppressed. And America has let them down. And perhaps we deserve to be damned for it. They're invisible, hidden by another invisibility, privilege. What did we privileged folk expect right to say? Don't worry, God loves you and is taking care of you. There's the lie. Privileged folk turn Jesus' words the poor will always be with us into the false belief that humans cannot solve the problem of poverty. So why bother? Right responded, oh, yes, we can. And that it hasn't happened is shameful. This country is capable of better. And saying so is patriotic. But privilege can blind us, immobilize us. Privilege is not a black problem. It is not a women's problem, nor is it a gay problem. 
we must make it change. And sometimes it takes a prophet and strident language to get us to budge. Indeed, we often merely get defensive as Bill Sinkford warned. I found it interesting that each of the three viable presidential candidates in 2008 connected with one of the isms that conspire to create privilege. Senator Obama and racism. Senator Clinton and sexism. Senator McCain and ageism. I'm surprised the media didn't glom onto this and start speculating about which ism is the strongest, which ism matters most, and thereby trivialize it into a game of rock, scissors, paper. Have you wondered why they referred to the candidates as Obama, McCain, and Hillary? Could it be sexism? And why did they keep marveling at how well McCain was holding up to the rigors of a national campaign? Obama's mother was white. Why is he black? Where does the trouble over privilege come from? Are we as individuals connected to it? Well, of course we are. But we cannot expect some sudden groundswell of social change to solve our problems over difference. It takes individual effort to redirect the wheels of change. The trouble, the reason we're stuck, comes from privilege and the paradox of pretending it's non-existent. It is often invisible to us, even at, to us as people who promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Now, some may think that I'm haranguing you because you've done wrong, that I'm blaming you for being privileged. But it doesn't work that way. Privilege results from group membership and, as I said, is unearned. It is defensiveness that keeps us paralyzed, stuck. However, to get unstuck over privilege and difference, we must individually, as did the Reverend Peter Morales in resigning as president of the UUA. Now, I am white, I am male, I am heterosexual, I am well-educated, able-bodied. My labors have been among the ranks of professionals. I am privileged. All these attributes provide an identity that places me among the privileged of this society. But I'm not a bad person, nor am I guilty of something. Except for the education and career pieces, these attributes were purely accidents of birth. We have an intractable supply of isms, racism, classism, ageism, ableism, heterosexism, ad infinitum. Every one of these isms means that somebody gets the short end of the stick. And for every short end, there is a privileged long end of the stick. Those who get the unearned long end of the stick are privileged and can wield power, leverage over the short enders. 
They can demand that Jeremiah Wright not preach the truth as he sees it. Power and privilege accrue to groups, not to individuals. The people like Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos may be exceptions. Great personal wealth begets great personal power and personal privilege. Many of us get exasperated with apparent personal privilege, but in the broader context, power and privilege are accorded to all recognized rich people. It's not personal, it's classism. <clears throat> White males in our society enjoy considerable power and privilege. Oh, that's me. But I don't feel power, powerful, or privileged. That must be other white males, only some white males. We may be tempted to say that we're not part of the problem not a barrier to social change because we don't actively participate in the system of power and privilege. Nevertheless, we benefit. I never get pulled over for driving around some upscale neighborhood. I never get followed around by store security when I'm shopping. I can ignore my racial identity and think of myself simply as a human being. Some people claim that privilege is a thing of the past, not true. We as Unitarian Universalists have an obligation to help tear down barriers to diversity if we are going to honor our UU principles. And that means doing something about identity-based privilege and the power it confers. I remind you, racism is not a black problem, nor is sexism a woman's problem. These are problems of the privileged. Put a little differently. Why is there no white history month? Why is there no white Miss America pageant? Because the whiteness of these things has been taken for granted. Because our founding fathers were all white. Race, gender, sexuality, and other attributes become invisible to the privileged and attempts to gain recognition to even out the short end, end of the stick are attacks on privilege, on the status quo. I've been able to get on any public golf course I wanted to all of my life because I am male and white. It has nothing to do with how badly I play. I've always been invisible. I belong to a privileged group. My presence on the course goes unnoticed. Society says, you have every right to be here. This is not true for my friend, the Reverend Roland Johnson, an African-American minister and, and a golf buddy many years back when we both lived in Tennessee. Golf is not a black sport. It's too country clubby and hence white. Things have certainly got better in my lifetime, which illustrates that systems of power and privilege are not necessarily immovable monoliths that block diversity forever. Yet, there were golf courses where he and I could not play 
because he was uncomfortable there. All vestiges of power and privilege will not magically disappear, nor will merely the passage of time lead to the blossoming of diversity. Systems of power and privilege and the processes that support them have plenty of inertia. And it's it's not easy to give up the long end of the stick. We UUs would all agree that the folks at the short end of the stick are treated unfairly. But there is unfairness at both ends. The privileged haven't earned their privilege. The white male driver is essentially invisible even as a black male driver becomes the center of attention. The default golfer is a white male. Political and corporate CEOs are white and male. What is fair about this? And I'm sorry, tokenism does not signal fundamental change. If we white males try to keep a death grip on the long end of the stick, we may hang on for some time. How long depends on continuing to sell the idea that our privilege is really nothing and that we personally are not really involved. Some defensive white males claim, well, I'm not a racist, so don't blame me. Or we might say, what? <laughs> me privileged? No, no way. You must mean Elon Musk. But consider this. It's fine that you're not a racist, but what are you doing to end all those isms? thereby promote diversity in all social settings. The eighth principle that is a hot topic among UUs is a proposal focused on combating racism. Our existing seven principles form the heart of what is actually Article 2 of the UUA bylaws. A commission has been working on assessing the possibility of rewriting Article 2, and they've been doing this since 2017. A major result is the proposed eighth principle. Its inclusion as a principle will be voted on at the 2023 and 2024 General Assemblies. But what exactly is in this eighth principle? Well, here's the text. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying toward spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. Of course, that opening affirmation applies to all of our principles. The remainder is, to me, really unlike any of our existing seven principles. And this is part of my problem with our proposed new principle. Now, am I about to get defensive, trying to maintain my privilege? 
I hope not, but it's, but it's not easy to be certain. First, I believe there is a real need for a new principle, one that deals with systems of oppression. The isms, in other words. To me, our seven principles, our, our ethical bedrock, are fundamentally aspirational. We want to recognize everyone's worth and dignity. We strive to understand the interdependence of all creation. The need for a new principle that addresses oppression in our world is legitimate. I agree to that. But I do have some issues with the eighth as it is proposed. Let me say at this point that we religious liberals are capable of being just as intransigent, stubborn, as our sisters and brothers on the religious right. You must be a racist if you ask questions about this proposal. This kind of response occurs altogether too frequently. And it has happened here in the past. And just because I've been around this movement for nearly seven decades does not make me a dinosaur, someone to be shoved aside. That said, what are my concerns with the eighth principle? First, it's too long, confusing, and proscriptive. It's telling me what, what I have to do and implies that I'll be held accountable, whatever that may mean, if I don't measure up. Are we going from aspirational ideals to a must-do creed? Even more importantly, it singles out racism as the most important ism. The words are accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions. Have sexism and ageism already been dismantled? I think not. And what about the others, all of which play into systems of power and privilege? I agree that we need to take action of some kind, and a new principle dealing with oppression, power, and privilege is in order. However, I'm skeptical that the current proposal fills the need. Diversity cannot increase without our help. And in some isms, we have made strides. But the journey toward spiritual wholeness is incomplete. Indeed, we seem to have arrived at a crossroad, so to speak. We can take the easy, well-worn path forward but it may not lead toward a dismantling of power and privilege. We need to challenge ourselves to take the path less traveled. Perhaps, perhaps this is so. We are, after all, not certain what lies ahead, but it will be different as Robert Frost Lord us. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere 
ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Indeed, may we so choose to help bend our universe, our journey toward justice and toward spiritual wholeness. May it be so, and amen.